Great to have you back, and uh, we look forward to your talk. Great. Yeah, so this is work that I did as an NSF postdoc here with Craig and Steve Beisinger. Very happy to be back. Thanks. I know that the uh, regular seminar series is over, so thanks for fitting me in. And yeah, I hope I can convince you today that you can care about buildings and ground squirrels. I, uh, just basic outline, I'm going to talk about some background in California climate, uh, why montane mammals are a good focus to study it and its impacts, um, the impacts of climate change and climate. Grinnell Resurvey Project, which I can probably move pretty quickly through with this crowd. And then the methods that I used for my study and what we found in our resurvey, what environmental predictors seem to be um, most highly correlated with uh, buildings, uh, distribution shifts, and finally what they're going to be doing in the future. This might be familiar from, to you. This is Adam Smith um, put this together from PRISM data. So this is the last hundred years before we did our resurveys. You can see that it's very orange-red. Uh, over the last hundred years, it's gotten a lot warmer, especially in minimum temperature in California. The pattern for max temperature is uh, more variable. And in fact, uh, precipitation patterns are fairly variable as well, with a lot of increased precipitation seen across California in the last hundred years. But we, uh, as the, you know, the museum researchers think a lot about snowpack. And this is off the CalAdapt site, uh, made right here on our um, very own Berkeley GIS lab. The, it's a great site. You should go to it. There's all kinds of tools to play around with. Um, this is snowpack data from 1950s, snow water equivalent. And you can see if you focus on the purple, it gets smaller. And then projected into the future, it gets even smaller. And so it's, um, you know, this is real data. These are projections looking at what snowpack is doing. And you probably know this already because, unlike me, you, <laughs> you weren't in the Congo the last six months you were living in California. And um, this is just another view of that, those projections of snowpack. Different models show different degrees of decrease, but they all show that it's going to be decreased in the future. But anyway, this is what it looked like this last winter. This is um, from the Western Regional Climate Center's uh, website. So if you ever looked at the um, California Climate Tracker, it's really great. If you haven't, do it. It's fun. It shows monthly data. It's really just fun to play with. And this is up until uh, April 1st. You can see it's very red. So we're looking at 25 to 50% of normal across the state. This is cumulative. So basically, what did the California winter look like this year? But you might uh, know that just this since then, uh, it looked slightly different. And so in the last, just April, this changes um, because there was a big snow dump. So this is California Climate Tracker, and you can see that in April, it was 443% of normal precipitation. And I shouldn't say just a snow dump, because this um, really highlights what's happening with climate change. So this is the weather of this year, but it really gives us a feeling of what some of the issues are. Because if you get a lot of precipitation in April during a warm period, so it was also particularly warm in April, it's going to come out a lot as rain or rain on snow events and just cause a lot of flooding. And so what we're seeing with climate change is decreased snowpack, increased variability, increased rain on snow events. All these problems are going to potentially affect the ecosystems and the species we care about. And that's what we do here, right? We think about these things. And so one of the focuses of the Grinnell Reef Survey Project was um, changing distribution of mammals in the mountains, in the Sierra Nevada. And I'd like to argue that montane mammals are a good indicator of the effects of changing climate. And here's some reasons why I think that's true. I, um, although I do think that Belding's ground squirrels, and I hope that you're convinced after the, the end of the hour, um, are actually a better poster child for climate change impacts. I have a secret life as the uh, founder of the California Pica Consortium. <laughs> so um, 
I had to throw the picture up of how cute they are too. Um, <laughs> anyway, the um, the uh, Monte mammals um, in general, these are generalizations, but they tend to have restricted dispersal ability, tend to be habitat or, and or dietary specialists. So they're more vulnerable to shifts um, in the timing of their food resources and plant timing. They are sensitive to increased temperatures because um, they're adapted to these very cold environments and they tend to not be able to handle um, more high or warm temperatures. And uh, they're experiencing more extreme seasonality um, in general throughout their history and also as it gets more extreme. In particular, um, as I said, through reduced snowpack, uh, one of the studies that came out on pica recently showed that um, one of the hypotheses of why pica may be disappearing um, in the in the West in general, though not so much in California, is that uh, as snow melts out, as there's less snowpack, as there are more rain on snow events that melts out the rain, the snow, you get this paradoxical situation where the pica actually freeze to death because there's less snow. And that's because they're not able to use that insulating blanket of snow against the very cold weather. You can see this is also could potentially be an effect, have an effect on hibernators who um, metabolically are, as they're hibernating, have to increase uh, their metabolic output um, to keep, maintain their temperature at that same level. And so can actually starve to death through hibernation get through their fat reserves really quickly if there's this no buffering um, snow blanket. And then, um, as I mentioned, the rain and snow events can uh, um, have a similar effect. And uh, finally, there's just extreme weather. It's an extreme environment. Extreme weather then affects it even more. There's anecdotal evidence from a study of Belding's ground squirrels in the 70s where a late winter storm came through and just wiped out um, almost the entire uh, population at a site because of um, this um, just one extreme weather event. So if climate change is predicting a, a more extreme weather, you can see those effects in the mountains. So I can um, preach to the choir here. The Grinnell survey, the Grinnell, original Grinnell surveys collected this amazing data on mammal uh, vertebrate distribution vertebrates in general across California. And uh, the boxes are some of those sites where those were really focused. Those sur original surveys were focused. It was Joseph Grinnell and his colleagues at the Museum of Vertebrate Zoology. They recorded incredibly detailed and wonderful notes. You can see here uh, um, talking about the distribution of BGI, the California ground squirrel, these annotated maps that are just uh, an incredible resource. The idea being from a Joseph Grinnell. Uh, I particularly like this quote because I started this project in 2010, and he mentions a century. Um, after one century, after 1910, uh, the somebody in the future, the student of the future, will have access to the original record of faunal conditions in California. So there I was. In fact, I will blame Craig um, really briefly because in 2000, in 2010. Um, I just started my uh, postdoc here in the early spring, late winter, and was still focusing on what species, trying to decide what species I was going to focus on. And I think it was May when Craig said, I have this great idea. Why don't you go look at what's going on with Belding's ground squirrels? And as, as all of you Sierra Nevada researchers know, you have about a three to four month field season, and it starts in usually around June. And so he said, like, why don't you go do this? And it was maybe the end of May. And I said, OK. <laughs> so I had to um, figure out how to be a Sierra Nevada biologist. And it was very exciting for the um, getting all those, figuring out, going to buy a tent and the traps and everything <laughs> from start to going. And then we ended up finally going to a site where it was um, under three feet of snow. And I came back and said, oh, good, because I wasn't really ready yet anyway. So I had three more weeks to prepare for that field season. So as you know, the Grinnell Resurvey Project went back in the last decade to uh, look at how these uh, faunal distri distributions have shifted in the last century and uh, went across the Sierra Nevada and collected all these wonderful data. They were able to go back 
to some of the exact same sites based on those detailed notes I showed and also um, some pictures. So you have these neat photo retakes. You can see how vegetation has changed and know that you're exactly in the same spot. And we have now papers coming out, papers that have come out showing that um, the ch changes have in fact happened. This is the classic paper from um, the group, the first big paper to come out and it showed that although there's a lot of variability, um, about half of the um, species, the mammal species had in fact um, shifted their uh, distributions in the way predicted um, according to how climate had changed. One of these species interested me in particular, and it um, had a, in fact contracted a slope in Yosemite. And I wanted to see what was going on across the species range in California. And if we have more data, we could kind of focus a little bit more on what was happening across that range, and if there were actually exceptions to this rule. Were there places where the species had not contracted that were low elevation? that might tell us something about how um, species can actually persist instead of just where piece of species are disappearing. So uh, the reason I chose the Baldinger's Ground School was not just because Craig told me to, but um, because they're actually uh, great study species for many reasons, including that they're highly detectable. So they're diurnal, they alarm call, they live in groups, they have these obvious signs, like these trails here from the burrows. Their burrow, uh, they live in burrows and um, they do in fact hibernate, which is interesting for some of the results. They're also habitat specialists on montane meadows, which is a um, habitat that's really an ecosystem that's very important and interesting in many ways, both ecologically and from um, even a management and even a tourist perspective. If you think of some of the places in Yosemite, for example, that are best known and best loved, they're off in the meadows. So again, talking about a species as an indicator, we could potentially use these data to tell us what is happening, not just with this species, but what's happening with the ecosystem that it uh, depends on. Also, they're really cute. Um, and there's a lot of great data out on them, uh, data from researchers that were associated with the MBZ, the data on their dispersal, on kin recognition, vocal diversity, Lots of data out on the species. It's a really well-known and well-loved species, so we thought, well, people probably already know about what's going on with it as a, as a pop, um, population and, and, and range-wide in California. Um, and as you'll see, they, they didn't. So uh, I went back to these wonderful field notes, both online and in um, hard copy right here, and found some uh, sites where they were found historically. And we, my field assistants and I, revisited those sites. We did visual resurveys at 74 sites where the buildings was found, were found historically, either through trapping records historically or visually. We did it in, in summer, May to September. And um, we also trapped at 31 of these sites, but we found actually the visual surveys were more reliable than the trapping to see whether the species was present. We had uh, several observers, we went, revisited sites, and then we um, analyzed the data, the climate data, I'll talk about are from PRISM 800 meter, and we used the bioclim variables, conducted some occupancy modeling to see um, original, uh, initially, and then went on um, using classification tree analysis and species distribution modeling. So I mentioned the field notebooks. Uh, you can see here, this is Grinnell, 1918, and he mentions that he, um, this is where Belding I are persisting, or are, are occurring. There's all these wonderful notes. Um, these are, this is a species account uh, page of Cytelis Belding I now. Um, and this is Benson from 1947. So pages and pages of these notes. And there's also just little hidden gems that you can find, so here's a like, little, <laughs> Belding's family there. The one in the back, I love because he's sort of like, am I doing it right? <laughs> um, and we also were able to use photo retake. So um, here's a site that I visited, and I was able to go back and say, yep, that's exactly it. There's that same crack. Here's the same site. And so through this and the detailed notes, I was able to know that I was going back to exactly where they originally saw the species. But of course, you can use this to look at vegetation change as well. 
So in the end, as I mentioned, there were 74 sites where the species was historically present that we then resurveyed. I then threw a buffer around each site of two kilometers to say that, um, and to incorporate whatever uncertainty about exactly where the site was. And if we didn't um, observe the species in that site, we then tried to survey all the meadow habitat within that two kilometers as much as we could to see if it's also present there. So if it was present in any of that two kilometers, we considered that site occupied. This hatching is the IUCN 2010. Uh, distribution of the species and so you can see that we're focused on the western half or the southwestern edge of the of the species range but it's still a good portion of it these are those sites 74 sites not just in Sierra Nevada all the way to the top of northern of California and again the original surveys uh, took place in the first half of the um, 20th century and the resurveys were pretty much in 2010-2011 but I used some of the surveys from the Grinnell Resurvey Project, some of the data from that as well. I mentioned occupancy modeling, detectability for the species is really high. So for the majority of the sites we visited more than once and we had a higher than 99% um, certainty that if we did not see buildings there, they were not occurring there. So for the most part, we just assumed um, that uh, non-detections were true absences. So again, here's the 74 historical presences in yellow here. And we found out of uh, those 74, 43 of them, the species were still persisting at. So we observed the species at 43 of those sites, which leaves 31 sites where the species is no longer present. So uh, that was really surprising, actually. And I thought, okay, well, what am I missing? Well, what if there's just um, some metapopulation dynamic going on? Maybe they've disappeared out of these sites, but they've colonized other sites. So in order to try to control for that, I went back to the data from the Grinnell Resurvey Project, and I found from the historical um, surveys, I found places where buildings were not historically present. So historical absence sites. And then, um, we either had resurveyed those or through the Grinnell Resurvey Project, those teams had. So I found 47 sites where they were originally absent and none of them had been recolonized. So that was giving me a, an idea that this seems to be a real pattern. So overall, it's a 42% rate of site extirpations across California. So the natural next question is, what's causing this? So I looked at all kinds of different correlates, environmental correlates, including was this the site um, meadow habitat, was the distance to running water, to water bodies, looked at um, prism data, the bioclim variables, um, annual temperature, precipitation, winter, summer. Considered management status, if it's a park, if, if it's private land, if it's generally federal land. The presence of other ground squirrel species that we were also able to survey at the time. And then human modification, which by which I, I'm defining that here is sites on the landscape that have been um, had either uh, water or um, food supplemented. So for example, a city park where um, there's sprinklers running all the time or, um, a sorry, a county park, or a, a campsite where you'd think there'd be a lot of extra kind of food from people. So we considered all these variables and um, did a classification tree analysis, which I'll show you. But these are basically the things that came up. We also had some interesting um, correlation with the presence of California ground squirrels, which we'll be uh, looking more into in the future, but there's the California ground squirrel was also correlated with the temperature variables, so I won't be talking too much more about that today. Just to show you a little bit what the data looked like, this is elevation, and so we like to talk about elevation. It's very um, easily understandable, and you can see here that the sites where the species was no longer present <coughs> tended to be much lower elevation than the sites where it had persisted. In fact, um, there's more than a 500 meter difference um, on average. This is correlated with temperature. Um, 
And so you find that the sites that were extirpated were tended to be higher in temperature than the persistent sites. Another way to talk about this, and um, finally, and then precipitation variables were, were actually fairly interesting. This didn't come out as strong of an effect, but we found that <coughs> a positive change in summer precipitation or in precipitation overall was correlated with extirpation. That's something we're still thinking about. So here's the results from the classification tree analysis. I don't know if you've done this before, but it's kind of fun, especially the output like this. I like it. So um, we start with the, the most, the three uh, uh, factors that came up to give us the lowest error rate were these two that show up and also that change in summer precipitation, which doesn't show, show up here, but is incorporated. So we have our factors here. Here's the sample size, the different sites. Blue is persistence and white is extirpation. So this is the proportion of sites where the building, where building I persisted. So basically you can think about, if you have a modern average winter temperature less than negative four degrees Celsius, there were no extirpations. So they're completely persisting at these sites. But if it's higher than that, and there's no human modification, so I call that natural here, so it's not a park, it's not, a, it's not an alfalfa field. You actually see a lot of extirpations. So this is out of 40 sites here. And you see that when there is human modification, this, is, this effect is really ameliorated. So you have much higher persistence here. So to think about that a little bit more, and um, you can think about this here. This is hard, so I'm going to go through it slowly. But um, first of all, what might jump out at you is these blues. Now blue is on here is human modification. And so most of the blues are happening at low elevations. That's partly because it's parks and um, agricultural fields that just tend to be at lower elevation. But you can see that there's hardly any open blues. And open is extirpated. Filled is persistent. So you can see that almost all the blues are filled. You can see there's one empty open blue there. Whereas down here, you can see that almost all the, the red browns, the natural sites, the non-human modified, are empty, which means that they're extirpated. Whereas down here, you can see there's a much higher rate of these filled circles. So in the higher elevations, you have higher persistence here, especially with the natural sites. And you can see again that winter temperature and temperature overall is uh, positive or negatively correlated with, with elevation. In other words, lower the elevation, the higher the temperature. This is another way to look at this. I just want to point out that there's a big difference in elevation between these sites, the clear box here is these natural sites. There's a big difference in elevation between the, what's persistent, where they're persistent, and where they're extirpated. So what's happening so, here? So what are the, green, the green boxes there are the modified sites? The green boxes are the modified sites. And I, I put them in green because I'm going to hint at this idea, which is, thanks Craig, which is, <laughs> Are we seeing some kind of anthropogenic refugia here? This picture um, is, anyone that's not seen this picture know what that is? <laughs> Jim, you can't answer until everyone else gets a chance. <laughs> that right there, it's a water body. Okay, Jim. Mono Lake, yes. <laughs> okay, so here's Mono Lake. And um, so we, we're getting into the Great Basin here. It's really dry. Okay, this is sagebrush here, all these dots. So one thing that hopefully jumps out at you is this emerald green, beautiful little circle here. Um, this is Little Lake <laughs> County Park. It looks like this. This is like Kentucky bluegrass, like <laughs> lawn. It's watered once a day. We can talk about the ethical implications of, what, of doing of really, like maintaining this, but side the point. You can imagine, for a species that eats grass, 
and burrows, this is an oasis. This is their little habitat out here. And in fact, this um, area, broadly speaking, had six historical sites where buildings were present. This little spot is the only area where they're persisting in this area. In fact, the next elevation point, this is fairly low elevation, the next elevation point is over 500 meters higher than this spot. So they disappeared all around here, but they are everywhere here. You're practically stepping on them. If you ever want to see buildings around Squirrel, just cross over, the, go through Yosemite over there. They're great. Um, another example that we found of this is um, up in the north, on the Modoc, this is um, <laughs> apparently uh, Belding's ground squirrels are not only responsible for plague but also for crop circles. Um, <laughs> so the farmers out there are literally burning, drowning, burning, gassing them out of their burrows. Um, we went up there and they told us about, um, we went to trap up there and they had said, Oh yeah, you can stay in the cabin. We made friends with the farmer. You can stay in the cabin if you want to trap here. That's great. You know, I think it might be a little dirty because the hunters just left. The squirrel hunters just left, and it took me about five hours of until that I heard him echoing in my head, and I went back and I was like, "Did you say squirrel hunters?" <laughs> <laughs> like, oh yeah, they just left. Like, oh, how many do you think they killed? What did they? What did they, he say, Christina? Two thousand. <laughs> and I was like, oh, how are we going to trap here? But no, not a problem. We were, they were literally, we were picking them off the, as roadkill as we went. And the only place in all of California I've seen them as roadkill. So they're like, don't worry, it doesn't, doesn't hurt at all. <laughs> doesn't, doesn't, doesn't make a dent, that's what we said. So um, obviously there's all kinds of other interesting issues with population flux, but this, again, you can imagine as an anthropogenic refugia that they're loving this alfalfa up there. Okay, so we wanted to then take the results of this <coughs> classification tree analysis and look into the future. So we compiled um, a separate database, not including these resurvey sites I've already talked about, relying on Arctos and Manis data, and also places that I had, um, we had incidentally observed uh, or not buildings um, in our work. We compiled this data set. This is uh, historical in purple, orange is modern, and there's a bunch of absence. Uh, absences are in triangles, um, modern uh, presences are in circles. The idea being, here's that same outline. It's a fairly good representation across the, the range of the species. But most of the data on absences occurred in California, so I'll be showing you projections just of California. So we uh, used GAM models to do species distribution, used GAM to do species distribution modeling. And we first uh, modeled from historical to present, so these are real data modeling, and then we can test against this the, the data we have, and we ended up with a AUC value of 0.76, which is good. And we used the predictors that we had from um, the classification tree analysis. So the colors here are uh, uh, more blue is more likely to be present. And uh, the, so then the browns are less. We, so I cut it for California and just focusing on this part of the range where the species is present. And so you can see that um, as we move into the future, there's projected to be loss of the species. And this is for Hadley, uh, the A2 projection is a um, more severe future, but Hadley is a slightly less. We also looked at CCMA, which you can barely see it anymore. Um, the idea, of course, is not to say this is where they're going to be exactly, but to say that if this is in fact what's driving the distribution changes that we are seeing, their distribution changes, and uh, it's, uh, we do seem to have some data here that say that seems to be having an effect. Then things are looking like they're going to be moving, uh, getting worse into the future. And that's, of course, supported by the fact that we think that the future is going to be warmer, and they seem to be doing worse in sites that are warmer.
Now, originally, I didn't uh, go into this uh, idea, this project, thinking I would be promoting <laughs> county parks or alfalfa fields. <laughs> but that I'm interested in looking at the potential effects of natural climate change refugia, natural places on the landscape that are buffering species from the effects of anthropogenic climate change, the effects of warming and drying, or in this case, potentially increased precipitation. And so we are able to now pursue this idea further, partly relying on the results I've shown here, and partly on some more surveys <coughs> that I've done. So this is, of course, Yosemite. We then went back, uh, we, uh, my field assistants and I went back and uh, surveyed sites where buildings uh, were expected to be present in Yosemite. This is fairly high elevation. We looked at meadows, basically. We looked at places that we knew they were there historically and other places where we suspected they could be. And green is where they, we found them. So you can see that they don't occur in the southwest of Yosemite. They, don't, they hardly occur at all in the west of Yosemite. But there's a couple sites here that are sort of interesting. This is pretty high up here. But this isn't necessarily. So there's some sites where they seem to be per, um, present that maybe are exceptions. And that's what we want to focus on. What is it about a site like this that allows this uh, species to uh, be present? What, is there something going on that's buffering the climate there? This is our resurvey data, but we're able to then go back in. And so Sean Marr, who's the, now the postdoc for the project that we have, um, which is titled here. We got some money um, with Craig as the uh, PI, and Steve Weisinger will be um, co-PIing, I guess, from the California Landscape Co uh, Conservation Collective Co Cooperative. And um, we're going to be looking at uh, this idea of finding, identifying climate change refugia on the landscape and also landscape connectivity. And I just flipped through real quick. A lot of this also relies on genetic data. So I'm um, going to be talking more about that on Saturday if you're going to be there. But uh, looking at genetic connectivity through the genetic uh, analyses and gene flow. Lindsay Eastman did this, uh, her senior thesis on this partly. Marissa Lim has been working on it for a couple years. So we have great data on looking at gene flow. This little dot there is that Mona Lake County Park and it also pops up different, unique on, in terms of genetics. So just to summarize, we, got, we had this species really, we thought really well known uh, in terms of past research and just in people's experience and found that, at least in California, it's disappeared out of 42% of the, its known distribution. It seems to be dis have disappeared out of places that are higher in elevation, higher temperature, potentially this increased precipitation. But that uh, human modification seems to ameliorate that effect. So are human modified areas acting as refugia? One question is, looking back at this here, is uh, we find that there's not a lot of gene flow happening between this site, this refugial site, and the rest of the range here. There's maybe many reasons for that we're going to investigate, but there is a concern that these sites act as sinks and maybe are not actually uh, going to be uh, effective into the future. And finally, um, we found that the extirpations, uh, because these uh, situation is expected to increase into the future, are also expected to increase into the future. OK, I hope I said we a lot, because there were so many people that did this study with me. Um, I already mentioned uh, Lindsay and Marissa and all the great work they've done in terms of analysis. Uh, this is Ilaria Mastroseria who did a lot of the work with us and Christina Castelli who was there like through thick and thin and snow and rain and everything and I couldn't have done it without her. So uh, thanks also to everybody and all their support here and I miss you guys a lot. <laughs> so thank you. Thanks, thanks.
Okay, so we have uh, ample time for questions. If someone can just push the like button, just push buttons at random. <laughs> After 10 years, I still don't know how to push the like button. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to worry about that. <laughs> uh, okay, so questions. Do you know enough about the climate variables for these different sites to be able to identify, you do it at one level, but to be able to identify in more detail, those meadow systems where you expect extirpation versus those at the same elevation where you expect persistence? I love and it. I love the question. Oh, sorry. Was there a second? Well, I just, <laughs> and, and so, just you know, and can you use that then to actually ask, you know, what are... You know, is there a difference between, you know, and to what degree is that difference? And therefore, can you use that as a management tool? Is that? So, Jim, if you're available on Friday for our LCC workshop. Yeah. <laughs> I just no, uh, where's Sean? So, um, that's what we're working on. So, Sean's now been here for a month and a half, two months. And that's exactly the idea of this. So, as, as, uh, often research goes, I sort of ran out of time in my postdoc to get to that exact question, but that's what my original idea was. And that's what I'm hoping we can really pursue with this is, can we get the climate data that will then um, be able for us to identify the environmental correlates that will then, uh, we can, so we zoom in and then come out again is the idea. So we now have <coughs> the data that say this, okay, they've blinked out of here and here and here. The species can tell us something's going on at this site. Maybe that anecdotally one site or two sites wouldn't be enough, but we have a lot of sites to look at. Yeah. So overall, what is it about those black sites versus the green sites, or however I did it, red versus blue sites, that why are they, have they disappeared out of these and not those? And um, a little bit that the refugial sites maybe can tell us, uh, input that a little bit too. We, what we're doing is we're working with the flints on the 270 meter data, um, the climate data. They have used hydrological models, so ho hopefully can um, get really get down a little bit closer and smaller grid cells for us to really like focus in on the climate at the smaller, smaller scale. But that's absolutely the idea. So are we seeing certain climate um, differences there. Also, is it just, you know, is it the Icebox Canyon idea or cold air pool or is there something about those sites geologically, in terms of vegetation, anything that's different than the other ones? And then we can look at the other species, hopefully, that occur in those meadows or even translate that to other types, um, species that live in other environments as well. That's absolutely the idea. LCC is focused on having results that managers can use and so that's what we're hoping. They, original idea was when I was in the Forest Service of the research, a Pacific Southwest Research Station, and they were saying, you know, this is potentially something we can work on, how, but how do we know where they are? Yeah, I was wondering if there are opportunities to see if um, this whole matter of climate change, it looks and clearly is very deterministic. Creatures live in one place, circumstances become unsatisfactory, and so on, but at the same time, uh, another thing that uh, determines uh, species distributions are, are uh, say, stochastic events. And so, in this case, just looking at the building ground squirrel, say you could look at, say, 10 or 100 sites that are probably not going to make it in 50 years or whatever, and these animals are going to go, these populations are going to go extinct. Now, how do they all go extinct, you know, the same year? Probably not. Do some last much longer? And so we're looking at this actual, and this force we know is universal throughout time of how populations come to grow, sometimes just by chance, you know, they didn't locate a mate at the right time or spent too much time horse around here. And you get population extinctions. Now these are big events evolutionarily and often we're just looking at the maintenance and growth, but it seems like this whole matter of climate change and you're examining beautifully enough, you know, individual populations essentially, uh, especially with something like building ground squirrel that's restricted to its meadows and so on. And so I'm just wondering if there are opportunities to observe how much of these uh, extinction events are, what's the force of randomness? I mean. And this kind of connects to another point that you didn't mention is exploring. We know that like water and temperature 
distributions determine how well they do and so on. But what's the, you know where what's the cutting edge? It's like uh, some animal you know doesn't get a drink of water or it's too hot and so it expires or I'm saying what are the specific events that cause animals an individual in this case to make it or not? Okay, well your second question first, mechanistically absolutely we want to get there. Uh, we have uh, one of the reasons it's interesting to use this species is because we have data on dispersal, and I didn't mention, but they have some data on what causes them to go into hibernation, what causes them to come out. There's some uh, physiological studies that have been done. And so really linking what's happening with them um, at these sites to what's happening, what is actually, this, the climate to what's actually happening to, at the species body level, and um, what could potentially causing those extirpations is really interesting, and hopefully the next step, hopefully we'll get there. In terms of uh, stochastic events, well, absolutely there's, you know, I, I gave the anecdotal example that there was a site that was well studied in the 70s where the, there was a big extreme weather event and the population was pretty much wiped out. But then it was recolonized because if it's a pretty good site, these species, the, the species will refill it. And so uh, if you have a site that's out where there's nothing, no other animals around, at least as they start blinking out of these sites, yeah, you'll eventually have, you might eventually have a totally empty place on the landscape, and I see that a lot. It's not, the map that I showed you, there, there are definitely sites that are bunched. And so, uh, but you would expect if it's just a stochastic event that you would get dispersal and recolonization. And we were finding these really strong correlations, so I didn't expect to see this kind of thing. This is a really, in, in, for me, a really pretty incredible um, statement of what's happening in terms of temperature and how that is at least correlated. We don't know exactly the mechanistic, but as I talked about earlier, there's a lot of reasons why to, to expect <coughs> that they'd be affected by hot temperatures. But we have that this is they're really persistent when it's cold and that they are not where it's warmer. And this doesn't look like just a random event. This looks like it's cor that there's a correlation with something bigger than that. So Jim, <laughs> Jim. So I apologize if you already addressed this. It, it seem, I mean, it seems really, um, you know, 100% clear that the human modified sites are sort of a confounding variable at some level. So I'm just curious if you if you ran your future forecast analyses or if you've rerun any of the other analyses looking for correlations between environmental variables and extirpation, excluding from consideration the the specific sites where human modification has allowed these things to persist. Okay, so I should have mentioned this. Uh, for the most part, there there should be hardly any of those in the in the projections uh, of the human modified sites, because the the data from Arctos and Manus, although to be fair, I, I I didn't visit all 400 of the sites or whatever, so I don't know them exactly. But you can I read through all the descriptions, and some of them are my own sites. I didn't include any of human modified sites in there. Uh, most of the time, because why I have so many human modified sites is that I went to the site where they originally said it was, and either they were there was a meadow and they weren't there, or it was a totally different. It wasn't a meadow, and so that was weird. And so then I just started looking around and looking around, and I found this. And I was like, okay, well, they're still here. So that should be that human. That basically, those projections shouldn't include human modified sites. It is interesting to think about, okay, if we incorporated them, what would it look like? But again, that starts ending up feeling a little bit like I'm saying, like, let's build parks everywhere so that we can, and maybe that ends up being... Plus, it would just confound things, right? If, right. Temp if you have a strong relationship with temperature, and yet you have these, these uh, high temperature sites that still have populations only because they're human modified, then you wouldn't get out there. Right, yeah, yeah. yeah. So they're not yeah. in the analysis there. Just to quickly follow on from that, but one thing that intrigued me about your future projection, of course, being with those with some skepticism, is that um, the Modoc Plateau is looking pretty good. So, what's your message to the farmers out there? Keep the uh, keep your squirrel hunters on staff, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Just thought I'd mention that, Michelle. Yeah, well, it's not, it's related to the anthropogenic uh, um, effects. Um, because the other thing, too, since it's the Sierra Nevada that we're talking about, is the fire suppression. So you've got this interesting 
thing, I'm just wondering if this has been part of your thinking there, you know, with fire suppression, but they're also meadow specialists, so now you're going to have that kind of dynamic in play, and so maybe some of the, the extirpation sites might have to be a result of fire suppression affecting whether or not um, um, meadows are persistent. You this know. is one of those, uh, yeah, and I just noticed that a couple of your re-photo <laughs> takes, I mean, you know. I have that, thought about it. <laughs> yeah, that, that one photo retakes, like, you know, right. obviously we're, we're losing meta. For right. Reasons, right. So, right. I mean, so you've got that extra, um, that you, you've got the um, anthropogenic effects occurring on both ends, I suppose, is what I'm trying to say, persistence as well. As I think it's a really good point. So we're losing meadows, we know that, naturally, out of the Sierras because of, you know, the things I've listed here, including that fire suppression. And uh, we would expect that that would affect buildings and that they would just be disappearing more as they're losing their habitat. Unfortunately, we just don't have the vegetation and habitat data, at least from what the data I've been working with so far to be able to really say what's happening. And so um, it's also part of hopefully the work we're going to be doing on the LCC grant is trying to really get some good meadow data to see how, how they're But moving. in the classification tree analysis, you could also score sites as having being meadow, not meadow. Because presumably if they were there in the past, it I was did. meadow. I okay, did. So didn't. that didn't pop out. OK, yeah. But that's partly because these human modified sites right. We're not meadow, and they were doing great. And so there's this. Yeah, so you're getting it on both sides. So yeah, but that's a really good point. OK, there's a question up here. Yeah. Um, the, what, so were the, uh, the temperature variables that you included, or the, or the climate variables that you included for sort of past and, and present, were they 30 year means? Um, or I guess what was the nature of those? How were those? I should have. I'm sorry, I <coughs> mentioned that. Yes. And and then if they and if they were, would it make a difference? Maybe if you looked at instead of a, a mean sort of at, at both ends of your sort of sampling points, you somehow incorporated the the, the pattern of climate in the intervening hundred years. Yeah, I mean, this partly goes back to the conversations around the table with the Grenadier Survey Project for how many years was it that you were. <laughs> puzzling and maybe still trying to figure out exactly what climate um, window type to use. So it is interesting, actually, to think about that. I mean, it turns out that basically that all the temperatures said the same thing, at least with the 30-year window, and it was a clear enough like message. So we don't know if it's exactly winter or if it, you know, I, I prefer winter to average. And in fact, that did come up slightly stronger, just because as Craig always says, like, they're not really experiencing average. But uh, I think you always say that. Anyway, <laughs> somebody always says that. So uh, I think it's a good point. And there's absolutely, I mean, extremes, you know, you can think about that. It's just such a long period. But, yeah, I guess I'm not thinking so much in terms of sort of extremes within here, but more um, sort of year to year variability. Um, so instead of taking a 30 year mean, what if you took a 10 year mean or, or, or a 40 yeah. year mean? I don't know. Yeah, and we've played with all of those things, but it's a good reminder to go back and think about that. Thanks. Well, I just think the way forward with that is to, is to try to get together a mechanistic model and then really pick the right climate variables, whether it's variance or mean or minimum. So I think there's, there's such a big space of different climate variables and ways of manipulating them. You can fish it around and find a correlation eventually with just about anything. But if you have a mechanistic model, then you've got a much stronger a priori reason to pick that particular variable. But it's really a challenge, and if it's any physiologist in the room interested in mammals, please talk to us. Yeah. Uh, one more question. There was one more. Yes. Two parts. Um, <laughs> what, what's happening at the, at, the, at the margins of the range, like the northern end? You didn't really talk about that. And the other part would be, what, what you focus a lot on the, on the physical uh, environments that the animals were either persisting or not persisting. What, what's the relationship between closely related species that they could be competing with um, at the hot end of the range and the cold end of the range? Right. I mean, part of it with, with California, it's not just about the north versus the south, but it's also we're looking at a very strong elevation difference in these sites. You know, we went from 11,000 something all the way down to 5,000. So, and some of those lowest sites are up in the north. Uh, so, edge, it, you know, it's interesting to think about edge, but 
we partly that's uh, confounded by some of the um, anthropogenic sites. So I don't, you know, this whole thing could be considered an edge. It's a third or third to a half of the species range. It's all kind of on the southwest edge, which you would consider, you know, to be the the southern, the more warmer end. And uh, well, I guess just really quickly to get to your, uh, so that's I guess that just relates again to when we want we want to really dig in and try to piece apart more locally local scale stuff. But you don't know whether they're moving north in the Cascades. Oh, okay. I see what you're saying. No, I don't think. I mean, this is this is the most detailed analysis anyone's done. Nobody has looked range wide. People just don't know. I don't. There may be anecdotal evidence that the people see them where they didn't used to be. I don't have those data. There might be something out there from observations. It's interesting to think about. Um, but we don't see it necessarily just coming up from the south here or something. Uh, okay, and then the others, really quickly, those other species, that was what started us on this project in the first place. Not so much uh, direct competitors. What we wanted to see is California ground squirrels had, have either may, remained stable or um, expanded their range over the last hundred years. And <coughs> the buildings had contract. we knew that they had contracted and we wanted to see, is this actually from direct competition or what's happening? Uh, it turns out that they actually don't really share, even if they're at the same site, they're not sharing the same uh, environmental space. You'll find the buildings running right through the meadows and be beachy, the California ground squirrels are much more edge species. Although California ground squirrels are about two, twice, Lindsay, the size of um, buildings ground squirrels. And so there's anecdotal evidence that they eat baby buildings. And so there might be something going on, but in reality, they're not eating the same food source. And so we think, Although they're they're having this opposite uh, the, uh, pattern, it's more likely to me they're responding to climate <coughs> differently. One likes both the warmer climates and also the edge habitats. We talked to so many people who said, "Oh yeah, as soon as they built this road through here, the Bel the beach eye, the California ground squirrels popped up." So they like the development that they're seeing through California and all that. So I don't think that it's they're responding to each other. But we do have a lot of data, and we still need to look into that, and that's another species we're going to focus on for this, this grant. Okay, better wrap it up there. Um,